Thank you very much for joining this session. So um, let me open my slide. So this is a workshop on the core culture metadata interest group. So the, um, this is background, the uh, CCMM interest group. Actually that was launched more than half, half a year ago, but uh, it was quite silent because of my laziness. And um, it, the, this interest group was proposed to develop a, to develop a core model, which helps understand the uh, organization of the metadata to describe various types of cultural entities, including intangible things or the new media things. So the basically in my understanding the, uh, I'll say the traditional or the conventional, the metadata standards, uh, I'll say for the cultural object, cultural entities, which are mostly developed by the uh, memory institutions community, library, museums, and archives community. So that are um, quite item centric. And but um, the, our environment has changed. So the, now we need to think about the linked open data and the web environment. And also the, we have the, quite a new type of cultural object as well as the intangible cultural heritage things. So we need some new ideas to develop new metadata and uh, the, meta, uh, the data model to define the new metadata schemas and standards. And so the, the goal of this interest group is to share basic issues and collect ideas for our next step. So this is agenda of this workshop. So as um, actually the, I'm a quite an old participant of the Dublin Core community. So in nineties, so more than 20 years ago, the Dublin Core workshop, the Dublin Core event was quite interactive and very enthusiastic. So because uh, we were doing something new. And so the, my hope for this workshop session is to have an interaction and a very active discussion. But um, before the discussion, we have the four talks. So the uh, Masha and the LP and Magnus and myself. And uh, we will talk about our standing point and uh, what we have been doing. So, and then we will have an open discussion with, the, with our audience. Okay, and uh, as um, so the, in my sense, as a tradition of the Dublin Core community, the, I think everybody can ask questions if, when you have that. And uh, please raise your hand. Okay, so the, may I ask Marsha to start your presentation? Okay. I will share my screen with the recording prepared. Okay, I think you can do that. Oops. Okay, I think we are viewing. Mm -hmm. 
Masha, do you have any trouble? Uh, what? Uh, any question? Any problem? Actually, um, oh, very low value volume. Yeah, and I don't see your I say video. Okay, it, I will. Maybe not using not using the habit. Wow. Uh, something is not working. <laughs> I wonder how that will work now. Um, yes. My discussion point is what should the CMM core cover? I will be talking from the cultural heritage description level and descriptions three perspectives and the standards. All of them bring us to this question. What should the CCMM core cover? A description level is an indication of the level of description based on the physical form or intellectual content of the material. A description may represent an item, volume, group, subgroup, collection, series, set or component. An item is an individual object or work. It may be composed of multiple parts or components. Second group. This is based on the USA's practices. An archival group is an aggregate of items that share a common provenance, share a common provenance. Archival groups may range in size from several thousand items to just a few items. Groups are usually defined by repositories and they may have several subgroups that are established by archival principles of provenance. A group often contains many different types of objects. Volume, this is one that everyone is very familiar with. Just like uh, printed books, manuscripts, sketchbooks, and album. The fourth description level is collection. A collection comprises multiple items that are conceptually or physically arranged together for the purpose of cataloging or retrieval. A collection differs from an archival group because the items in the collection are bound informally for convenience and do not necessarily share a common provenance or otherwise meet the criteria for an archival group. Description level is called series. 
a series comprises a number of works that were created in temporal succession by the same artist studio and intended by the creators to be seen together or in succession as a cycle of works. Works in a series typically share the same or related subjects, same or similar media or other characteristics. But their defining characteristic is that they were intended to be conceptually related as a series. Individual items in a series may be described separately and linked to the series. The sixth one is called set. A set is an assembly of items that the creator intended to be together. A set differs from a collection in that it is typically smaller and was intended by the creator to be grouped together. Multiples, that's another description level. It typically includes general information about a printing plate and the prints made from it. This type may also be used for sculptures and other works produced in multiples from a plate, mold, computer program, or other device or method. The next one is called component. A component is a part of a larger item. A component different from an item in that the item can stand alone as an independent work, but the component typically cannot or does not stand alone. For example, an architectural component. Now let's rethink. What should the CCMM core cover? Based on those description levels. In the second part, I would like to share my observation and understanding from the cultural heritage description's three perspectives. The lamp data processing in the semantic web could be considered in three stages, starting from digitization of unstructured data. That during the last two decades, many digital collections were born in lamps and have exhibited strong outcomes. The creation of those digital products involved a very complicated digitization and documentation process, requiring tremendous investment from government and other institutions. But just digitizing is not the end product. The lamps are dedicated to transforming the unstructured data into structured data. I would like to bring three perspectives from the creation of the structured data. We deal with any object first, people looking at the production perspective, that including uh, creating the metadata for this object based on descriptive metadata, administrative metadata, structural or technical metadata. This thing can also be looked 
go inside, see the content, and more metadata can be created and the, the feeling the relationships, the feeling the entities, the relationships among all different classes in the knowledge graph. And the reflected by the indexing, by the markup, and by the de designing of ontology. The third perspective is from audience receiving interest. This is what we call use metadata, how this thing are used. Looking at the productions perspective, there is one part administrative metadata. I use this example, a photo from the May 4th archive in the Kent State University. So you can see there is a pole above that girl's head. However, when this was spread out all over the country in all the medias, major journals, reports, that poll disappeared. This means that administrative metadata is the critical ones tie with each of the objects. When we deal with objects, they may be have completely different types of um, in structure. The classes, the properties, everything will be different and knowledge base should be designed, supported by ontology. Okay, let's rethink about that. Facing so many complicated different levels and different perspectives, then we see the different types of metadata. So what should the CDMM cover in this core? The final part, we'll have a look at the metadata standards. As for the current standard updates, we have created a current standards updates 2020s in the Dublin Core website. You can see that updated frequently. The first one was about metadata for general purposes, like Dublin Core, schema.org. Be frame. But the second one is about metadata for cultural objects and visual resources. The rest of them also have about the research data, archives, preservation, provenance, and also related for publishing and press communications. Different metadata standards have been developed and created for specific purposes to guide the design, creation, and the implementation of data structure, data values, data content, and data exchange in an efficient and consistent manner. Let's focus on the standards for data structures. If I go back to the beginning of metadata movement in the digital age, in the 1990s, there started to have various different types of metadata standards for data structures usually called element set. Besides, you all know that Dublin Core has 15, but uh, 
the others can have over 500 elements. Majority comprise between 100 and 300. The metadata standards for data structures went through from very large and complex ones to small core vocabularies. And the early ones host all elements in the same namespace, but later since 2003 newly developed vocabularies, well, a lot of them can derive from or have been built on existing standards and more application profiles were developed. That's a big change. Then around um, 2012, schema.org emerged, which absorbed many existing vocabulary components, but it's characterize their approach as a modular structure. It has different classes and then properties and could cover almost every kind of thing. So, what should the CCMM core cover? Let's start our discussion here. Thank you, Master. So, at this moment, I think we can take the uh, one or two questions to Master. And uh, Master, thanks very much for your I say, comprehensive and also the deep thought. Yes. Questions? No question. Okay. If not, uh, we can, uh, okay. No questions. Then can I move on to the next talk? LP, would you start? Sure, if I have uh, screen sharing privileges, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. My name is LP Colodangelo. I'm a doctoral student at the College of Communication and Information at Kent State University. And um, it's really a delight to talk to you about um, some of my research perspectives related to intangible cultural heritage. Um, I'm also gonna to touch on some other things that um, many of you are probably far more experts than I am, but um, I'm really delighted to get the opportunity to, to talk to you about some of my ideas. Um, my outline for this talk is to first define what I mean by intangible cultural heritage, discuss the safeguarding paradigm that started with the 2003 UNESCO uh, convention on ICH. We'll talk about some applications um, for ICH, uh, techno technological applications, uh, data modeling applications, and then um, some things I wanna share that I consider some draft principles that um, we might wanna consider when we talk about integrating ICH in terms of data modeling. So first, as part of the 2003 convention, um, they defined ICH as the practices, representations, uh, expressions, knowledge, and skills that communities, groups, and in some cases, individuals recognize as part of their cultural heritage. Um, other scholars have defined this more generally and conceptually, such as that which cannot be touched, but can be felt through other sensory organs. The 2003 convention also discussed broad categories, uh, subdividing ICH into oral traditions and expressions, performing arts, social practices, knowledge and practices concerning the universe, and traditional craftsmanship. 
In the development of a core model, we need to be mindful of being able to represent at a fundamental level such varied ICH as different bodies of indigenous knowledge and belief, different genres of dance, theater, and ritual movement, as well as processes like weaving, garment making, and culinary arts. In addition to the 2003, con, uh, con, in addition, the 2003 convention outlines a vision for what's called safeguarding, a safeguarding paradigm, which is defined as measures aimed at ensuring the viability of intangible cultural heritage. In outlining that vision, the convention brought, offers broad strategies for safeguarding through these actions, including identification, documentation, research, preservation, protection, promotion, enhancement, transmission, particularly through formal and non-formal education, as well as the revitalization of the various aspects of such heritage. We might look to these as functional or user requirements for our core model. Scholars have since expounded on the definition, arguing that the safeguarding paradigm emphasizes the necessity of cultural communities passing down their traditions, marked by active embodiment and dynamic practice of the heritage in each subsequent generation. Documentation and recording alone are insufficient, as the viability of an ICH within the safeguarding paradigm requires maintenance of the cultural practice to be human-centered, living, and sustainable. Safeguarding is therefore complicated by the immaterial nature of ICH and the uncertainty of its transmission, the vulnerability of it being dependent upon human and social environments, and the pressures of globalization, modernization, homogenization, and marginalization. This has contributed to the characterization of ICH as fragile and endangered. Researchers and scholars um, have also added other relevant observations uh, and, and dimensions for how to safeguard uh, ICH. First, there's a recognition that any effort to preserve, represent, or transmit intangible heritage is underpinned by the notion that intangible heritage is inextricably bound with elements of tangible heritage, including cultural objects and artifacts. Next, uh, recognizing that documentation alone is insufficient. When documents about intangible heritage are created or stored, they must be in support of or used in systems that are intended to help cultural heritage practitioners share and transmit their ICH knowledge. Furthermore, systems and institutions can meaningfully participate in safeguarding by assisting intangible cultural heritage practitioners. This is done through facilitating access to their knowledge and work and by providing material and technological support for their cultural practices. Finally, much of this work reframes digitization as not an end in itself. Much like how mere documentation is insufficient, recordings and other digital representations should be captured with the intention of being integrated into platforms and tools, which will aid knowledge building and sharing, such as educational and training systems. So with that in mind, with that safeguarding paradigm in mind, I wanna look at some applications and models for ICH uh, that have been implemented. And um, I think this is gonna be instructive to use as a, a jumping off point for the things that we might uh, consider in terms of ICH and the core model. Um, the way that I've structured this is thinking of ICH research relevant to our work as being broadly grouped in three areas, preservation and documentation, uh, interaction and transmission, and knowledge organization and representation. In the case of preservation and documentation, we're talking about um, making digital objects and re representations for, uh, for various systems. Interaction and transmission research um, is really about the development of technologies that support and allow human beings to experience ICH. And then finally, knowledge organization and representation, I think is at the, obviously at the core of what we're planning. Uh, relating to how to organize and store data and represent concepts that are really going to inform um, the other the other two relevant areas of research. Um, I want to touch briefly on, uh, although there's a lot of information here, I want to touch briefly on those first two areas related to preservation and documentation. Um, one of the areas is uh, for ICH is essentially how memory institutions contribute to how helping practitioners reach the safeguarding paradigm. So that can include uh, library and archive initiatives at the, especially at the national level, such as making audiovisual recordings and narrative documentation. 
Museums also act as special partners for helping to provide gallery space and logistical support um, for practitioners in the safeguarding of their own heritage. Next, um, digitization. That is in terms of developing digital resources uh, and digital surrogates and instantiations. Um, these can range from the drafting of uh, um, uh, digitization policies, best practices for digitization, and then uh, practical implementation such as digitization labs. A big portion of ICH relates to, and digitization relates to motion capture. The sampling or recording of motion is three-dimensional data to make three-dimensional representations. Um, it's often used in computer-generated characters and environments, uh, which in, are included in systems for, um, for learning and education, like uh, learning dances, practicing dances, and other uh, traditional movement-based arts. Remembering that digitization alone is not sufficient to pass on ICH to newer generations, preservation depends on human-to-human -human transmission. Um, to be truly safeguarded, ICH should be communicated from one person to another and learned by others. So it has to be actively understood, performed, and practiced by knowledge bearers and practitioners and communities. Uh, digitization supports these efforts, but really we should be looking and make sure that we're supporting tools uh, that allow um, ICH to be transmitted. Among some of those tools are social robots um, and multimodal uh, archives for cultural interaction. So think of ways in which um, all elements of human communication, such as language, expression, movements, are um, created in, uh, in interactive uh, tools and technologies uh, to be able to transmit ICH information. Um, we also are, are looking at the notion of cultural user experience, the exhibition of sources to activate learning, an environment that, I, that in encourages exploration and offers something universal to all people of all backgrounds. Um, augmented and virtual reality uh, are a couple of ways, including also mixed reality, extended reality. Um, these kinds of technologies that allow um, safeguarding work in terms of um, people being able to interact in an immersive uh, environment um, and to have cultural and to have diverse cultural experiences. Finally, um, often those VR and AR technologies are used in developing uh, platforms such as those for serious gaming or education. Um, and I've noted uh, two really gold star examples here, the Terpsechore Project and iTreasures. So um, although I think we're going to get into much more detail on this, I do want to touch on um, current data models that are used in ICH data capture, information organization, and knowledge building um, that often support, again, those other kinds of um, safeguarding goals like preservation and interaction. Um, it runs the gamut really between conceptual models, reference models, metadata standards, knowledge organization systems, and um, semantic technologies. Um, most of the work is going to be done on, um, on an ontology level, but um, I think we'll, we'll need to, you know, we'll need to look at, at um, some kind of underlying KOS and metadata standard that really addresses, um, you know, uh, a linked data environment. Um, Touching briefly, just I want to go through these very quickly, but um, CDOC CRM used extensively um, in a streamlined fashion for the linked art data model, um, but also influential on the development of other ontologies, such as um, one for, for drama information called Drammer. Uh, the object oriented Ferber, um, this is a harmonization between Ferber and CRM, representing bibliographic information integrated with museum information, um, often used in music and dance. Uh, projects. Um, I've highlighted two here, the, the Remus project about um, linked data and music, and the Litmus project um, about traditional Irish dance. The sample model of Finland, um, uh, this is actually a series of projects uh, that are all linked data and shared on uh, built on a linked data shared ontology infrastructure, aggregating cultural heritage information from heterogeneous sources. Probably the one that's most famous for our purposes is the culture sampo, which is um, allows users to explore data related to Finnish cultural practices. Um, the cultural heritage and digital environments model is a framework uh, to support metadata and digital archives for tangible and intangible heritage. Um, the goal is to identify entities to be described in metadata um, 
uh, the model differentiates between physical and digital spaces. For intangible heritage, that means conceptualizing metadata about real world ICH instances and performances as distinct from, but deeper, deeply related to recorded documentation, such as still motion, uh, images, text, sound. It's predicated on the understanding that while a single instantiation or performance of ICH is not the ICH itself, the ICH is still physically demonstrated by a recording of that single performance. Built on that then is the concepts embodiment and digital archives model, uh, which delineates two worlds inhabited by cultural heritage, the knowledge world of conceptual and abstract entities and the embodied world of physical and digital entities. We have to think of ICH as straddling those worlds composed of conceptual entities that are physically embodied or recorded. Uh, as a result, uh, the conceptual entities and the objects both um, of ICH must be incorporated into a fully realized model. In this case, the relationship between digital objects created from physical objects and recordings of ICH are contextualized in a digital archives environment. The model also refers to intangible entities, not as objects, but as experientials, noting that experientials may not be uh, directly archived, but there are entities which are the objects of metadata description. And here um, I've included uh, two um, figures from those models. Um, I hope that we'll get a chance to talk more about them um, because I think they're gonna be particularly informative in terms of separating some of those aspects of conceptual abstract, uh, physical, and then um, differentiating between the physical space and the digital space of, um, of our information systems. Also, um, there are bespoke domain KOS, and I've included a number of different domains that are um, that have been uh, modeled uh, ontologically. Some of these are the SORI, um, but uh, the, the idea is, is that um, there's a wide variety of these domain uh, KOS that have been developed. So we really are going to need to be um, cognizant of the fact that, um, that all of these um, all of these different kinds of domains are, are going to have to be represented on a fundamental level at, in, in our model. Okay, and I've included um, just a brief image that I, uh, that I worked up of my own uh, ontology for ContraDance, which extended um, uh, IFLA's LRM. Um, while I didn't mark all of the relationships between these entities, what I wanted to show is that really we're talking about some conceptual overlap in a lot of areas and different kinds of nuanced things like I had to express different kinds of expressions um, on a notated dance that's on a written level, on a called dance that's on an oral level, and a performance is an embodied physical level, um, which has implications for taking place in a particular time and space as an event. Um, I want to highlight some of the um, the conclusions that came out of um, the um, the the um, CEDA model, um, particularly I want to highlight for ICH the referential source, recording or description of an entity, the dynamic functional features and interaction mode, the ephemeral lifetime uh, having a temporary existence, and the movability of of physical collectability. I also wanted to bring up um, some of the things that came out of my own work, and um, I considered draft principles for semantic, semantic modeling of ICH, modularity of components from the most basic to the highest aggregated level, including intermediate stages, sequences, timelines, orders of events, differing levels of conceptualization, instantiation, and domain discourse. Um, that, similar to that is this, uh, is this notion that there were written forms, oral forms, and then embodied forms. Simultaneous support or validation of multiple and alternate forms of signs, um, ways in which, say, the same story is told multiple times using different kinds of language by different storytellers, but they all share sort of a, a single origin. And uh, finally, representation of complex contextual information relationships and networks of meaning. And this really gets to the heart of the safeguarding paradigm in the ways in which this, this knowledge is often and has to be um, embodied in, in um, and in transmitted between humans uh, and between communities. And with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to take any questions.
read that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Elpia, that you have mentioned what I wanted to say. I, I, and uh, I, CHD and uh, yeah, those things. And uh, we can take some questions at this point. No questions. Then, okay. The, I think Magnus is ready, and I'd like to move on. Just a moment, please. Start the presentation. Do you see the slides, Shigo? Yes. Okay, so it works out. Thank you for inviting me to uh, this uh, discussion workshop on the cultural metadata model. I was asked to give some input on the question of our experiences from our own projects where we are working on contemporary, uh, specifically contemporary popular culture. This is a field that is, in my opinion, also important to consider if we were to make recommendations for a cultural metadata model. And given that the field is extremely dynamic and is happening as we speak, uh, we also need to consider um, where do we want to get the data for such an endeavor? How, who actually catalogs popular culture? Unlike archives and digitization efforts, we have no other chance, in my opinion, than to rely on enthusiasts who are deeply involved with popular, popular cultural movements um, as the only possible source for any data on these events, happenings, and developments. In this short input, I would like to re again introduce our project so you understand where we are coming from. It, this might be a duplication for people who attended yesterday's um, presentation, but I'll keep it short. For those who didn't, you will get the gist what's happening. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the enthusiast communities we are working with, and I would like to focus this presentation on two aspects. The first aspect is the question, can we rely on the things the communities do? Are they reliable? Is the data quality or the recorded information from these communities usable in a scientific context? And another problem which crept up in our project and took us quite some time to resolve is um, the question of legal aspects of data and information curated by enthusiast communities online. Whether this has any implication on the CCMM is open to discussion, and I'm looking forward to that discussion. So what's happening in our project is that uh, we are working in the space of Japanese visual media, specifically anime, manga, and computer games. And the goal of a project is uh, to create uh, an ontology or even a full knowledge graph that represents the domain for researchers based on the data that has been collected by a very diverse set of enthusiast communities on the web. This is funded by the German Research Foundation in a three-year grant, and we are applying for another three-year extension to fully build out the knowledge graph at the moment. The communities we've chosen in our project are very diverse bunch. There are far more than the ones I'm presenting here. Uh, and just to give you an impression just how diverse these communities are, even the relatively closed and uh, viewable domain of Japanese visual media creates a very broad variety of communities that focus on different aspects of the domain, from broad interest in everything Japanese visual media and culture, which is our example community Anime Click from Italy, where they discuss Japanese food as well as Japanese manga, to highly niche, super hyper-focused communities like the Visual Novel Database, who only focus on a single type of game that is very prominent in Japanese visual media, the so-called visual novel, to communities that are very playful and focus on the aspects of the diversity of anime characters and really celebrate the diversity, the fun they can have and 
simply collect and enjoy in sharing information about just the characters and their roles in the stories. Besides both fan and enthusiast communities, there are other sources in our domain. Uh, for example, Wikidata collects data on virtually everything and of course also has some information on visual media and the Japanese government collects information on manga, animation, games and media art from institutions, creators and publishers in Japan in the media art database. Just to give further impression on is why we think these communities are reliable sources, just the not a reliable, a viable source is they collect a lot of information. Here are just our three communities, and you can see that each community has found the time and energy to catalog and describe over a hundred thousand characters, tens of thousands of works, and has put a lot of work in describing both the works using a very elaborate tech hierarchies and the visual characters using trade or character tech hierarchies. They also catalog the humans involved in the creation of the media. We see here, for example, anime click with over 40,000 humans identified as being responsible in some role or other with the creation of visual media. So we do have a lot of data. And this compares really good, well to the information, for example, in Wikidata, which by comparison has a limited amount of work, especially they have almost, in comparison, almost no information on characters. The Media Arts Database has a lot of information on the media itself, but again, very limited information on people or characters. The first question that arose in our project is, can we rely on the information the communities have collected? In order to do this, we did a random sample of anime and visual novel titles. The titles we chose because they can easily be compared to the gold standard of what is written on the physical object. So we can find images of DVDs, Blu-rays, can find opening animations on YouTube and compare the title strings in the original media to the title strings in the data set we had. We were focusing on the Japanese original title because that is A, the most easy to spot in the original media and B, most likely to be get gotten wrong by international communities where not every member might be fully aware of the intricacies of a Japanese language. The sample size was determined in a way that the Estimates we draw can be um, applied to the full population and well, student helpers and members of a project team manually checked the samples against the ground truth, which was usually images of media or sometimes the official websites. Here are some results to show what's happening in this uh, kind of sample drawing we have here. The visual novel database, you might remember, this is the community hyper-focused on the niche game. And um, we are here seeing the information on both the English and the original Japanese title. And you will notice that the amount of errors is very low. And you will notice that the error decision taken by our people who compared it to the ground truth is mostly typographical errors. In the English title, we have 475 absolute correct and 28 uh, are simply typographical error, which is usually um, some colons and blanks or other um, smaller discrepancies, like where's the dash in the title where the people would put a colon or something else. We only found in the original Japanese title two examples of explicit errors where something that is clearly present on the original media is missing or information that is not present on the visual media has been added to disambiguate or further describe the item. We compared this to Wikidata, which is a little bit difficult because as you can see here, we already have much more uh, possibilities for error. Wikidata did also have typographical errors, but far less. 
but we have here a much higher amount of errors where title information is missing or has been added. And to our, not, not necessarily surprise, but we were a little bit intrigued by the fact that even in our small samples, we draw things that are clearly not Japanese visual media and specifically not anime, even though Wikidata tags it as part of the domain and explicitly says this is media from Japanese anime. We did this for other communities as well, and the numbers compare um, very well to the ones you've seen from Visual Novel Database. Infusus website data is of very, very high quality. Whenever we spotted mistakes, it mistakes in punctuation, typographical nitpicking, that is important for using the data to match it automatically to other sources, but is not in any way uh, a, a misrepresentation of the things that have been seen. We've noticed that in Wikidata, the data quality level is much worse, and especially missing and incomplete data is a big problem. So we are currently not considering including the information from Wikidata into our knowledge graph as is, but need to have some other way of filtering. Interestingly, the Media Arts database, where we also draw a small sample, has shown errors that suggest that at some point in the creation of the anime information, OCR products have been used, and the errors we found show this quite clearly. So we have single characters that are just wrong, but are very similar to the characters that we would expect. So here, this needs further research what's happening here, and we will contact the media arts database people with examples so we can maybe find out what's happening here. So on the quality domain, we can move forward and say, yes, we might have very reliable data from these communities. A much bigger problem if you start working with communities is not only are they heterogeneous, dispersed, hard to reach, sometimes hard to communicate with, they are also not in any way or form prepared to share the data in a structured manner with others. We have, on the one hand, very licensing practices, which are, at least in our experience, very much a problem because there is, a, in the beginning, a lack of awareness and also a slight disregard for copyright issues. So these communities are not aware that writing an abstract on a media creates an individual piece of work that is copyrighted by the person who wrote it, and that person should license it to the community website in a reasonable manner. They are not aware that databases create their own copyright by just being large collections of data in the European Union. And if you want to give away the whole database, you need to explicitly allow the use of the whole database. There's also, if they are using licenses, a big variety in what is used. And these licenses are much, uh, to our discomfort, very often incompatible with each other. There's also the legitimate concerns of enthusiast communities. They are afraid of wholesale copying of their work. Some of these websites rely on advertisement and other interactive features to pay for server bills. And they obviously have a problem with having clone sites of themselves drawing people to the clone and uh, moving traffic to the clone site. And also they would want acknowledgement of their work, even if it's used in larger context. And also there's needs of our and similar projects. We, we just need a, a license for all the data that has to be open. It must be possible for researchers to use the data in any way that they see fit. And uh, then again, the licensing needs, needs to find something that is a compromise between the needs of the researchers and openness and the legitimate concerns of the communities and their already existing licenses. And then on top of all this, these licensing should work in most, if not all, worldwide jurisdictions, which is really tricky because copyright law in the, EU, in the US and in Japan, which is the focus of our project, 
is already very different. Just to give you an example of what happened, here are the original licenses of the um, five data sources we've seen in this presentation. Two of them didn't even have a license. Uh, one used the open data license, one used a, a Creative Commons license, Wikidata uses CC0, and uh, another uh, data source, which I'm here included for comparison, uses the CC license, but with restrictions as to the data source must be named, it must be used in a non-commercial way, and it must be shared in the same license which actually is the license we agreed on with all the communities to be that lowest common denominator that we could work with. Because as a research project, we are non-commercial by a definition of a license. Share alike is possible for us uh, because researchers would be willing to share their data and acknowledgement wants to be given. So this concludes my short input. And I'll stop sharing my slides, but I keep speaking for a few more seconds because what does all this mean for a workshop where we want to talk about cultural, core cultural multimedia uh, metadata model? Well, I would like you to consider the fact that uh, popular culture is also part of this cultural domain and should be considered not only the old dusty archives and uh, the history, and we need to consider that in order to work with this domain, we need data sources. And the model should help us integrate that data. It should help us work with this data, but it should not be like descriptive in a way that data must be organized in a specific way or else it doesn't comply to a model or cannot be worked with. We need in this domain to very much think bottom up instead of top down and a good cultural core, a core cultural metadata model helps us think about the available data that we already have, helps us integrate it, helps us deal with contradicting and or subjective information, which is a big thing in, in, in our domain where we have fans basically describing their impression of media and we need to integrate this information. It concludes my input and I hope I didn't overextend time. Okay. Thank you very much. Actually, the uh, so the your talk is from the popular culture side, or the so the pop pop culture or the subculture side. So the in that area, we need to collect data from the how say enthusiasts or the fans. On the other hand, so the memory institutions, libraries, archives, and museums. Uh, they are a kind of the authorities and they, they have their very established metadata and the metadata schemas. So I think we need to think of both, especially on the net, we need to connect them. So that's why the, your talk is quite important for this community and also the, we need to connect. Okay. Okay. Let me share my slide. Okay. And uh, do you see my slide? Yeah. And uh, this is the title slide. And I have several slides, but uh, because of a time constraint, I'd like to skip several things. And uh, just, I want to show some key slides in my talk. Okay, so the I'm um, how say I've been working on the digital archiving for a long time, and um, my position is quite digital archiving or digital archives based. So uh, here, here's uh, the digital collection, digital archive we call it, and so the okay. Then, so the to create this uh, collect this uh, collection, we digitally curate from the original real world object, or we start from the recordings of the original object. And um, in the case of intangible cultural heritage, we cannot directly digital 
digitize original things. So that we need to use recording. And uh, so LPE introduced the uh, CHD model that uh, in, in that model, I uh, uh, we defined the instantiation process for the intangible cultural heritage because uh, intangible cultural heritage is really a skill and a knowledge or those things. So that we cannot, I'll say, the, those the skills and knowledges are the, not visible or not digitizable. So that we need to use instantiations and we can record those instantiations. And so therefore this this archive, we can start from the, those instantiations. And then here I have just, I want to show this slide. So in my research, we have been working on the uh, Japanese, how say, pop culture materials. One is a uh, manga anime and the video games. So as you know, for example, in this case, this is Dragon Ball. I said Dragon Ball could be a manga or the comics, a book, printed book or a digital book. And also the, we do have the quite various how say, versions of the many the animations on Dragon Ball. And also the, we can find the game software. So, I think we can create catalogs for these individual or the manifestations or items for these things. But uh, how can we connect them? So these are kind of uh, multimedia franchise. So people know Dragon Ball and people would want to find some Dragon Ball manga book or people want to find Dragon Ball animations, how can we effectively connect those things published in different media? So that if we use the item-oriented catalogs, that is not very easy. And on the other hand, we, uh, as you know, the Wikipedia is a quite a rich resource and uh, we can find Dragon Ball entry for the Wikipedia or the fan created sites. And then we can reach some content from those sites. So that in a sense, uh, this program is a kind of a interoperability program, which DCMI community is quite related. So that is one area. And another area that I, I was interested in was uh, how can we digitally archive fireworks? So firework, okay. So the, as you know, the firework as an object is a, a ball which contains the gunpowder and some other how say, components. Do we archive that the gunpowder ball or do we archive the beautiful firework in the air? In that case, that fire in the air is a quite an ephemeral object. And we need to how say, record that firework, fire in the air using the videos or some other media. Uh, we could use, how say, high resolution, uh, we could make the high resolution virtual reality computer graphics for the fireworks. And we could use, uh, I'll say, uh, <laughs> okay, anyway, we can make the, uh, I'll say, recordings and we can digitally archive them. So what are we archive? What objects? Of what events are we archive? That is my very basic questions. And I think we need to have some nice model to cope with these problems. So that's why 
I'm interested in the uh, how say new data model for describing these cultural entities. Okay, so that's all. And uh, actually, I have prepared some slides, but uh, I can skip this. And uh, I like to I'll say. Okay, thanks again. And uh, yeah. uh, you may also um, check our NCAS workshop, which is Thursday and Friday in the free registration. Uh, some very different things. For example, I would talk about the health, the international classification for diseases. Well, they are dealing with all the situations, right? Uh, have to be immediately action. So how did, but the other side, on the other side, like LP will talk about, it's um, on the um, visual nomen, we call the visual, visual representation of a concept of, and also uh, from the ethic point of view. So those are in the NCAS workshop. And we already have the um, uh, abstracts available um, if anyone have time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And actually, yeah. the, yesterday's, uh, the, we had a talk by uh, Sean Petia, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, he mentioned about the comics for mental health. That right. was quite impressive. Mm -hmm. So the comics or so the pop culture is related to the health. So that kind of the, how say, cross over use right. of the content. That is quite interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then thank you very much. And uh, let me close this session and thank you. Thanks everyone. Uh, we'll